After easily the worst year of his NASCAR career, Jimmy Johnson said some pretty interesting things during his trip to the other side of the globe. How's it going everybody? My name is Eric and welcome to Out of the Groove. Haven't talked about silly season stuff in a while, but we're gonna get a little healthy dose of that today. Overall, kind of a lot of just miscellaneous news and notes around NASCAR the last few days, so we're gonna talk about a few of those things and I'm gonna give you my reaction and some of my thoughts. So let's get to it. I'll start with some of the silly season stuff. Tuesday was a big day for small team announcements. We'll go kind of in chronological order here. Uh, first announcement of the day was that Front Row Motorsports has signed Matt Tift to drive the 36 car for their Cup Series team. That team is now a three-headed monster with David Reagan, Michael McDowell, and now Matt Tiff driving their three cars. No sponsor or crew chief announcement was made, which is what I thought was the most interesting because I feel like, you know, Matt Tiff, let's be honest here, does not really have the resume to justify getting a Cup Series ride at this point in his career. Zero wins in the Truck Series or in the Xfinity Series. And remember, he spent that time in the Xfinity Series driving for Joe Gibbs Racing and Richard Childress Racing, two of the best teams in the garage. He has an average finish of like 13th in the Xfinity Series, which... I and that equipment is not good. And so because of this lackluster performance, usually when we see a driver like him get a ride in the Cup Series, it's because they have some sort of heavy sponsor support. Just being honest here, that's kind of how it works. We've seen it more and more these days in the Cup Series because money is tight. Money is tight for owners, so if a driver is funded, they typically are going to get the better, the better ride. It's the reason Danica Patrick stayed in that 10 car for so long. And so that's why I think this is interesting because they didn't make a sponsor announcement to go along with it. They just said Matt Tipt is in that, in that car next year, which I just thought was a little interesting. I, maybe the sponsor announcement will, will come out and it will prove that there's some sort of connection there, but uh, the fact that they didn't announce it immediately is weird to me. Now this isn't huge news or anything to me, because let's be honest, Front Row Motorsports is a 25th place team at best. You know, they made the playoffs with, um, with uh, Chris Buescher in 2016 off of a lucky rain shortened win at Pocono, uh, and that's basically been the highlight of the last decade. Wow, I guess they did finish first and second at Talladega that one time in 2013, so that was actually pretty darn cool. That was probably a better moment for them than Chris Buescher making the playoffs, if, in my opinion. But anyway, Matt Tift going to that ride next year is obviously good for his career, I suppose. You know, he wasn't getting that much success down the lower level series. Might as well take the Cup Series opportunity when it presents itself, uh, but I don't think this is big news. He's not going to run top 10 at all next year. He'll run 20th at best, and uh, we won't talk about much. But, you know, it's the right move for his career. It's just surprising, I guess, that he got it. I don't know, but anyway, let's move on to the other big Silly Season Cup Series announcement that came out Tuesday, uh, and that surrounds Levine Family Racing. Another small team, but that team has a lot to be optimistic about. They just signed Matt DiBenedetto to drive that car next year, DiBenedetto. A lot of people are optimistic. A lot of people believe he's very underrated. He's been in underfunded equipment. A lot of people think, you know, this could be pot pot potentially, ah, can't talk sometimes. This could be potentially his time to shine over the next few years. And that's because Levine Family Racing is also now switching to Toyota for next year and will be a Joe Gibbs Racing satellite team. They'll get resources from JGR, similarly to how Furniture Row did for all these last few years. And they're also going to get their engines from TRD. It's a big deal for that small team. There's a lot of reasons to be optimistic, but the announcement Tuesday um, probably gives you even more reasons to be optimistic. They announced that Mike Wheeler, who's been the crew chief for Denny Hamlin in the last several years, is now going to be the crew chief on that 95 car for Matt DiBenedetto. So this team now has a nice, sexy new technical alliance. They got a young up and coming, I think, probably underrated driver in Matt DiBenedetto, and now they're teaming up with a crew chief who has won races at NASCAR's top level, and has, uh, you know, he just won a Daytona 500 two years ago. The dude's got experience. He's been around a lot of crew chiefs in the garage area from what I've seen. Uh, think very highly of him. This is a big deal for Levine Family Racing. Also kind of came out of nowhere. I hadn't heard anything about Denny Hamlin and his crew chief splitting up. You know, Daniel Suarez over at Joe Gibbs Racing is kind of, you know, his crew chief is gone, and they're bringing in uh, Cole Pern to that 19 car, so that's kind of where the turnover has been. Didn't really see this coming from the 11 team, but you know, Denny Hamlin didn't win any races last year and was a first round exit in the playoffs, so maybe uh, maybe they're looking for some changes. Needless to say, this is a big deal if you're a Matt Benedetto fan or if you're looking at that team to possibly make a big step forward next year. Levine Family Racing's been basically irrelevant the last few years. This year, they had a few good moments, you know, with Casey Kane driving that car, uh, but switching to Toyota next year, switching to TRD and all that stuff, and now with the new driver and the new veteran crew chief, uh, you know, I don't expect them to like win races next year, but the playoffs are not completely out of the question, if you ask me. You can't directly compare them to Furniture Row because when Furniture Row, uh, you know, got the alliance with Joe Gibbs Racing, they had already been pretty good for a couple of years there beforehand, so they were already kind of established as a strong single car team. The Joe Gibbs Racing Alliance put them over the top. Levine Family Racing has not been competitive ever, so they're still going to probably have a year or two of growth before they get anywhere close to what uh, Truex and that 78 car were, uh, but there's still reason to be optimistic. You never know. Things could uh, things could move along faster than, than expected. I'll go ahead and mention this as well. I know this is mostly a Cup Series show, but I'll talk about the Xfinity Series right here because the Xfinity Series had a pretty big silly season announcement as well uh, yesterday, Tuesday. Chase Briscoe, who split time last year between several teams, Penske, Roush, 
Stuart Haas, it was announced that in 2019 he will be driving the 98 car for Stuart Haas Racing full-time uh, in the Xfinity Series. Big deal, obviously. He broke through, got that win at the Roval in the Xfinity Series, uh, driving for that SHR car. Landing this top ride is a great stepping stone for his career. He's kind of, you know, last year or so been like Ford's utility guy. Like I said, he worked for Penske, Roush, Stuart Haas, all the Ford teams last year in the Xfinity Series. But his best result was with Stuart Haas winning that race at the Roval. That probably is what put them over the top and, uh, and uh, got them so excited about this guy as being their potential future driver. So I'm excited for Chase Briscoe. Good move for him. And it's nice to see a guy kind of succeed and get a ride, you know, on merit. The last thing I want to talk about is what I mentioned at the top of the show. It's mostly NASCAR related. I mean, it is because it's involving arguably the greatest driver of this generation. But what I'm talking about is the Jimmy Johnson, Fernando Alonso driver swap that uh, went down over this last weekend. So yeah, Johnson and Alonso both took turns driving each other's race cars around the Bahrain uh, International Circuit, I believe is how you pronounce it. As you guys know, I don't really follow Formula One very closely. I know their season just ended and I know Fernando Alonso uh, is retiring from F1 racing and he's planning to run some Indy races next year. But beyond that, I don't really know much about his story. I know he's a he's an F1 great and that's about it. So we're going to focus on the Jimmy Johnson side of this because this is a NASCAR show and Jimmy Johnson said a few things, did a few things this weekend uh, that could be very important towards his racing future because I know there's a lot of Jimmy Johnson fans out there and he said some fascinating things. Some things I did not expect him to say. As far as the event itself went, Jimmy Johnson was actually pretty impressive. You know, he was only 0.2 seconds, two tenths of a second off of Fernando Alonso's time in the F1 car. And that was the, as far as I know, it's like one of the only times, maybe the first time Jimmy Johnson's ever even been in an open wheel car at all. So the fact that he got a handle on it that quick was very impressive. When they went to the stock car side, uh, Fernando Alonso actually was faster than Jimmy Johnson by a considerable margin. Now, obviously it's worth factoring that Jimmy Johnson's never raced on this road course circuit. Uh, Fernando Alonso's raced here plenty of times. So there's a familiarity with the track that probably played into that, but needless to say, both drivers impressed in each other's equipment, and so that was pretty cool to see. But it was what Jimmy Johnson said after running laps in that F1 car that I think will, you know, perk a lot of NASCAR fans' ears up. Johnson said that he is definitely interested in running a select number of IndyCar races shortly after he retires from NASCAR. Here's the full quote. 2020 is my last year under contract with Hendrick, and I have been approached many times about the Indy 500. I'm not overly excited about those fast ovals, but I think with my status and relationships, I could put together some road course races in IndyCar. I'd look at anything. He goes on to say, I've done sports car racing in the past. I finished second in the Rolex 24 a couple times in the prototype division. I'd love to get back to doing that. Anything's open. I'm far from done. I want to keep driving and hopefully I can find some good opportunities. Now all that's well and good, you know, I'm far from done. That's basically what he's been saying all year, despite his NASCAR struggles. But the most interesting part of that quote is the very beginning of it. The fact that he immediately calls attention to the fact that his Hendrick Motorsports contract is up after 2020. Something we're all well aware of. I've been talking about this for the longest time when we talk about silly season predictions. I think this is something most everyone is aware of. But the fact that Jimmy Johnson immediately calls attention to it makes me think that that is going to be his last year in the Cup Series. I said this for a long time that, you know, when 2020 rolls around, just with his status, with his age, you know, with his contract being up, you know, I just feel like that is going to be the end of his full-time Cup Series career. And the fact that when asked about running different events, he immediately called attention to the fact that his contract is up in 2020 almost makes it look like Jimmy Johnson's in jail and he's like looking at the year 2020. November 2020 is when, his, when he's going to be released from jail and can go do whatever he wants. He's going to be a free man again. Obviously, I'm being overdramatic. I'm sure he's loving his time with Hendrick Motorsports and still is going to be competitive the next couple of years in NASCAR, but it does interest me that he seems like he's already looking towards 2020 as his chance to experiment in other series of racing. Now, maybe this means nothing. You know, he can run the Rolex 24 and still run a full-time NASCAR season. Those do not conflict with each other. Running IndyCar while also running NASCAR is going to be more difficult, and that's where I don't think it's really realistic. I mean, it's not impossible. Hell, there's been drivers that run the Indy 500 and the Coke 600 in the same day. It's not impossible. But with his age and, you know, like I said, family and everything, I, I don't see Jimmy Johnson running NASCAR, at least not full-time, after the year 2020. So I like to know that now, and when people bring it up, he, he gets really ruffled about it. I remember on Twitter just a couple months ago, actually, he got really kind of upset and was questioning why fans are always asking him when he's going to retire, why everyone's uh, trying to make predictions like that. And when he said that and sounded all defensive, I was kind of surprised because I'm just like, you know, as a fan, I'd like to know when the people, the person I'm rooting for is not going to be around anymore so I can kind of prepare. You know, as a Matt Kenseth fan, I liked knowing almost a year in advance that 2017 was going to be his last full-time season. So I could kind of prepare over those last few months and give my driver, my guy, proper send-off. I feel sorry for Carl Edwards fans who just out of nowhere had their favorite driver retire on them. I mean, that would be <laughs> almost traumatic in a way. So pardon us, Jimmy Johnson, for speculating as to when you may or may not retire. You know, it's nice to be prepared. You got a lot of fans out there. A lot of people care about you. A lot of people want to know what you're doing. You know, you can't blame them for that. 
Anyway, y'all, that is my show. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. Those links are down below. Or you can become a Patreon supporter of the show, like Michael Harrison, Mentally Defective, Tice Moore, Cameron James, and the rest of these amazing supporters. We've added a couple new ones just in the last few days. I always appreciate the direct support. It means a ton to me uh, that you guys would support me in this way. If you, too, want to become a, a Patreon supporter of the show, you can check out that top link down below. I greatly appreciate y'all checking that out. Thank you so much. I also have a P.O. box, and that address is down in the description as well. If you want to send me cool NASCAR stuff, uh, I'll show it off in a future video and shout you out. I've already received a couple pretty awesome things uh, that I'm planning to show off in an upcoming video, so uh, thanks to those those of you. You'll see that uh, shortly, and uh, yeah, check that out as well if you're interested. I appreciate it. And I think I'm done with all the shout outs. I uploaded a video just a couple days ago giving you my top 10 paint schemes of this last season. I asked you guys on Twitter to send me some of your suggestions for, the, for your least favorite paint schemes of this last year, and you can expect a video of my top 10 worst uh, least favorite paint schemes of this year coming out in just a couple of days so stay tuned for that hope you guys are excited as always uh i'm eric thanks for watching really appreciate the support i'll see you guys again really soon bye bye y'all